I am a assistant curator at Queens Museum, um, and I just want to welcome everyone to our first day of culminating uh, presentations by artists from the 2018 to 2020 uh, Queens Museum Studio Program, as well as artists joining us from the Queens Museum Partner Program, um, Social Practice Queens, which is an educational platform and MFA program at Queens College. Um, it's a really bittersweet moment as this residency cohort comes to a close, um, but on behalf of the whole museum team, I want to say how incredibly grateful we all are. Um, yeah, how, how grateful we all are for sharing your dynamic practices with the Queens Museum's communities. Um, it was a real honor to have you on site at the museum, sharing space and working together. Um, while this year has been full of challenges, um, particularly for gathering together in the studio, I'm happy we can come together here to reflect and celebrate your work. Um, I also want to send a special shout out to artists Janine Hahn and Dan Riley, as well as Christi Christina Ferrigno from SPQ, who couldn't make it today, but we are sending our huge thanks their way. Um, so for the format of this event, we'll involve short presentations by artists Shin Liu, Jennifer May Reland, Lachelle Workman, J. Marie Kim, and Adam Nadell. And after each presentation, a QM staff member will chime in to pose a question to each artist. Um, at the end of the presentations, we're going to open up to questions from the audience. Um, uh, and to do to type in a question, you can just click the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I'll read your question aloud um, to one artist or to the whole group. Um, and lastly, I just want to note that this event will be recorded um, and shared on Queen Museum YouTube page. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen sharing and pass it on to Shin Lu. Hello. Uh, OK, I'm going to make it Perfect. full screen. Yeah. Looks OK. Excellent. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Xin Liu. Um, here's my website and my Instagram. There's lots of X in my website. Um, there's nine of them, so you don't have to count. Uh, um, I am an artist and an engineer. Um, in, in my work, which you will see in a second, I like to consider them as a combination of experiments and performances. And in the meantime, I create artifacts um, and using them sometimes functionally, sometimes um, expressively. Um, so this is kind of an example um, and a project I've been doing for several years. Um, it's called A Book of Mine. Uh, I was and have been very excited about um, the idea of astrology and like really um, growing up liking to read about like my, my future um, but then like I feel like there was a kind of dilemma within myself uh, because of my training and education I, I, I started to like kind of confused uh, around the desire to understand something so abstract but also at the same time uh, finding this disconnection between that way of understanding compared to what the modern society tend to tell us uh, what's going on with life. Um, anyway, um, the, the similar intention or desire result me doing a genetic testing in 2000, I think 16, uh, when I was just curious about what uh, another way of fortune telling and gen genome would, would let me know about my ancestry and my, you know, my, myself. Um, and that whole process result in um, the, this project, which is multifaceted in many ways. Um, first of all, uh, what I decided to do um, is to work with a friend that way end up um, sequencing my entire genome uh, ourselves in, in a laboratory. And then I printed entire genome and made um, a huge uh, book uh, out of there, which is like 900 pages uh, with this handmade accordion book structure. Uh, and part of the reason I did that project was actually uh, because that um, at a time it was tricky um, process to realize that the fact I did the genome test is also uh, actually giving out my own access and uh, certain copyrights or access 
access to my own uh, genetic data. So this is kind of reclaiming process, but also more honestly, it's just me trying to reconnect with something that is so abstract. Um, this project got much more complicated nowadays as uh, I actually are in the process of publishing the entire genome online and have been very interested in the, the idea about private um, copyrights as well as, um, well, in comparison or in contrast with open source data. Um, so, so before um, this year, um, I, my most projects, a little bit like the book, and this one I'm going to talk about, are, are mostly around uh, physical objects. And I have been um, playing around a lot with um, kind of building a connection between something is sensory and data experience and to, uh, with the, the abstract, uh, hard to grasp concepts. So uh, Living Distance is a long project, uh, an important work of mine uh, from the past two years. Um, it's kind of crazy. It's like, um, again, it's like a fantasy and a mission at the same time in which that a tooth was sent to space and, and, and came back, um, which actually happened. Um, so I was very lucky to kind of sneak in uh, sneak myself into an opportunity to uh, obtain this outer space launch opportunity, which you could read more about it uh, on the website uh, since our presentation time is very short. Um, and then the project in the end ended up being um, about that experience that is very performative, but also for me, it's like a kind of space mission because we actually build a robotic device that carried out that tooth to space. Um, later um, for the exhibition, uh, I was showing the, the channel, a two channel video that is both a documentation of the experience, but also kind of a performance aspect of it. Um, and then along with the show, of course, we um, have been very fortunate at the time I was able to show the physical artifacts I built um, while I was thinking uh, about that experience, extraterrestrial journey of my tooth. So you can see some of the, the sculpture pieces. Um, well, in a way, I was thinking a lot about like body um, and birth and death and like um, kind of disassembling and assembling processes um, in, in the sculptures. Um, and these are like kind of notes from uh, the time I was planning out the mission. Um, and then they, they later on result in this kind of semi drawing, semi sculpture format. Um, just really fast forward for this year, I think changed a lot. I, I definitely feel like a different way of working. Um, current, like as I'm like quarantining at home most of the time. Uh, so, um, the lucky part of me is that I uh, happen to have a project launched right before the um, lockdown happened in, in March. Um, I sent, together with my uh, collaborator, Lucia, we sent um, about 150 potato seeds, very tiny two potato seeds to International Space Station. And then later on, they came back um, to us in, in May and ever since we've been germinating and growing those seeds. Uh, this is a picture you can see uh, in, in my studio. So it's kind of nice to be able to um, have a creature uh, go, growing along with me in this time. And then this project is ongoing and it's really about how this space potato would be protagonist in a kind of, again, outer space um, travel narrative um, in, in future workshops and exhibitions. And maybe this is the last thing I'll mention is uh, that I have at the same time, though during lockdown, again, trying to reach out. So my partner and I um, build antennas out of a broomstick. This is a Muji broomstick in my hands in the picture. And uh, clothes hangers and using uh, software different radio systems to uh, receive signals uh, from the satellite in the sky. And there is a short video of me talking about several of this project and what I've been thinking about um, on the Queen's Museum YouTube. Um, 
um, it's a little bit about like a free fall feeling and being weightless uh, in New York City. And I think that's my time. Oh my God, I was so rushed. <laughs> um, I hope I was not talking too fast, but thank you. Thank you so much, Shin. Um, I really appreciate it. And I do apologize. I realized I forgot to read Shin's incredible bio, which I am now putting in the chat for everyone to see. Um, you know, Shin is someone we've been privileged to have in the studio. Um, and her, you know, she's, she's an arts curator at the Space Exploration Initiative at the MIT Media Lab, which is fascinating. And also has been an artist in residence at the SETI Institute and in New Inc. Um, from 2018 to 2020. Um, and most recently, you've been a faculty member at the Terraforming um, at the Strelka Institute. Um, so thank you so much, Shin. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to um, Queens Museum Community Partnership Manager, um, Catherine Grau, to ask a, pose a question to Shin. Thanks, guys. Hello everyone and thank you Shin for that wonderful, very quick but very wonderful presentation. Um, hearing more from you and, and looking a bit into your practice, I'm really intrigued by your various approaches to access to the realm of space and what's happening in space and, and just the range of approaches you have within that that are on one hand like hacking like with very simple materials that you just described like the broomstick to build an antenna and trace satellites to all the way to like building robots and like kind of um, entering those official ways um, and, and dimensions of entering that space. So I'm just really interested to hear you speak a little bit more about access and, and also I guess in, in your role as curator at the MIT um, space uh, art program, how you would like to see sp space feature in public discourse, because to me it, it doesn't seem featured in, in a very nuanced way and in a very accessible way. So I'm just really would love to hear you speak a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, I have a, like a longer kind of answer to that um, in Art Agenda interview called later called unspaced art. Um, but um, here I feel like your, your question is even more specific, which is awesome. Um, one thing I, I need to like put it as a, as a foreground is that the kind of unaccessibility, well, unaccessible or like this kind of idea of something really um, privileged and um, hard to tackle. I think there are, tr there are truths around it, but at the same time, it, it's also a, a kind of facade. Um, I think there is a question um, of um, dis disciplinary barriers that sometimes uh, I feel like we are putting it on ourselves. I have been talking with lots of people regarding like um, system and technologies I was able to use and also other artists who work with technology who have been playing around with it. Um, it is uh, really important to like really question whether it's something so exclusive. Uh, and then in the meanwhile, of course, we will have to learn and have to figure out the process and like hacker way or official way to obtain those those power. Um, I think that's like the first thing I was trying to like um, talk about in my work and I trying to encourage uh, my friends and my peers to like not be intimidated by things because um, it's a little bit like a PR. Uh, game sometimes I feel like just the way the media and the industry talk about uh, certain technologies and the industries um, it's so um, kind of more like blurring and putting out a facade rather than actually uh, explaining what's the uh, the detail of it like for example like the Voyager uh, which is the only human made artifact that has lived um, well, traveled outside the solar system. It is actually, its computer system is almost equivalent of right now, like a, let's say a remote car open um, device. Like if you have a car, you, you press a button, the car door opens, right? The computer power of the Voyager is almost similar like that little keychain uh, in your hand. So it, it's just, um, 
whether we are interested and willing to uh, dive in and feel like a little bit, if you can do it, I probably can kind of attitude. And I found that really uh, become something much easier for me to talk about, especially this year, because um, everything is closed. Lots of the so-called fancy facilities are closed. Uh, and lots of the research are actually done at home. Um, it, it just really helpful for like us to rethink about those structures and the ground we are um, kind of stand on and where we can like start communicate from that point. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Shin. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so next we have um, another incredible 2018 to 2020 studio program artist, um, Jennifer May Reland, who's an artist based in New York. Um, she attended Cooper Union and then spent a year in Paris as a recipient of the Harriet Hale Woolley Scholarship. Um, she was a resident at the Sharp Walenta Studio Program and the Open Sessions at the Drawing Center. Um, her work has been exhibited internationally at Galerie Thaddeus Ropac in Paris and most recently at Galeria Enrique Guerrero in Mexico City, um, where her solo show closes on February 6th quite soon. Um, she has a show opening the same day at the Lawn Sale Art Center in Houston, Texas. So go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, yeah, I'm so happy to be here talking to you today. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of the work that I have been spent the last two years on in my studio at Queens Museum, and then later um, here in my house after the beginning of the lockdown. Um, so this is the piece that I had completed um, during my, the largest piece I've ever made and a piece that I made specifically for the space at Queens Museum. Um, when I moved into the studio, which was in fall of 2018, um, it was such a large space, uh, you know, similar in size to apartments I've lived in in New York. Um, so immediately I had this sort of desire to encompass the space with a work. Um, and my work is drawing based. I do watercolor and pen drawings that combine historical narratives with personal narratives. Um, so I bought this really big roll of Italian paper and had it delivered to the studio. And it kind of sat in the corner for a few months um, while I kind of considered what use I wanted to put it to. And I ultimately, just took the paper and, and wrapped it around um, about three quarters of the space uh, in my studio and began working on it that way. And over the process of working on this piece of paper, which is, it, it's 26 feet long, the piece, so you can see it installed here um, in Mexico. And I made it, when I created the work, it was made wrapped around the entire room. And I have kind of preserved that method of working on it um, in the way I've displayed it. Although here you can see in one frame the entire piece with um, Iman modeling. So Iman's one of the other artists who will be presenting tomorrow. Um, and this work for me, because it was so large and it also coincided with um, when I began working on it, I was 29 and I knew that it would take uh, months to complete. So I knew that by the time I finished it, I would be um, 30. So I, I thought a lot about this sort of like conquering somehow this really large work and what, what that, that meant to me. And it, it ended up being a piece about generations. Um, the piece is, is called Martyrs. And I really conceived of it as a a personal pantheon of, of martyrs and the idea of martyrdom and culture. Um, I was raised sort of in between some different uh, religious worlds, but uh, sort of with one foot in a Baptist kind of evangelical world um, that was very, became very animated following 9-11 with narratives of apocalypse and end times. Um, and an almost a desire for martyrdom. So this idea has always been very present with me. 
um, my father is from a Catholic family and my husband's Catholic. So I always had this also, um, I had a really formative experience when I was young of encountering Catholic art and being really uh, overwhelmed by this sort of emotional experience of seeing uh, the human body depicted in this way that was at once very religious and erotic and the sort of commingling of beauty, violence, and religious devotion. Um, so that's a lot of what I've brought to this work. Um, and each uh, panel of the piece takes place in sort of a different time period and encompasses various um, martyrs, kind of real and imagined. Um, and borrowing tropes from Catholic art, which again, is just something that I've really kind of spent my whole practice looking at these tropes, especially dealing with medieval art and how these tropes are enacted um, in the media to this day in the news and how these narratives of martyrdom continue to play out. One of the starting points for the piece was the idea of the medieval virgin martyrs who are a group of um, virgin martyrs from the middle ages who all died in similar ways involving acts of sexual violence and religious devotion. Um, so I was interested in depicting these stories, which again, they're all kind of the same story. And it's a story about victimhood and what that role means exactly. I also devoted a large panel to a narrative of um, the Book of Revelation, which again was really formative for me when I was young, was um, encountering this book and um, these various figures. The, this is the, the Lady of the Apocalypse, the Whore of Babylon, um, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, these like kind of horrifying but entrancing visions of the end of the world. Um, obviously, another subject that's really important to me in my work is the role of women. Um, and I've done a lot of work kind of involved with, in this sort of past year, uh, creating these figures, dealing with the roles of women, childbirth, and incorporating these like holy women um, into these um, somewhat, uh, these scenes that combine the power of of kind of um, female beauty, eroticism with religious devotion. And that's really been a big part of my practice and probably will continue to be going forward. Um, a lot of my work is sort of autobiographical as well. Um, so this piece was like a bit of a takeoff from my own upbringing, going to sort of Bible camp and being really consumed with these ideas of, uh, of the end of the world. Um, finally, kind of moving to the present, um, when I've been working from home, um, I've been working on these smaller scale pieces. Everything I've shown so far is roughly life size, the figures. And I've moved to these smaller, more like intimate images of um, people like Princess Diana, who I kind of conceive of as this contemporary female martyr figure. Um, and I've been interested to explore that and uh, continue doing so. And uh, like Lindsay said, I have a show in Mexico City now at Galeria Enrique Guerrero that will be closing in about two weeks. And also uh, I have a show opening in Houston, Texas at Lawndale Art Center, which is in the museum district in Houston. Um, and yeah, it's very exciting. That'll be opening February 6th. Um, and will be up until April 25th. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so next we have my amazing Queens Museum colleague, uh, Charlie Fischetti, um, who is a Queens Museum Museum Experience Ambassador. Um, thanks for joining us, Charlie. And I think Charlie has a question related to some of the work on view in, in Mexico City, too. Hi, thank you for sharing. Um, so I was looking through some of your work online and I really love your pieces that center dreams. Um, 
like the alligator dream that came to life um, and obviously these um, Christianity specifically Catholic and tarot I think are like ways of um, dreaming about you know how we got here and where we're going um, I want to ask do you keep a dream journal um, and how do you feel dreams play a role in your art Thank you, Charlie. Um, I really like that question. So thank you. You know, uh, Charlie, I, the dreams play a really big role in my art. Um, and I'm sort of embarrassed to talk about this because I always think it's so, um, dreams are so meaningful. They're so powerful. They form a really big part of our lives. Uh, and yet communicating dreams to other people, it's so uh, kind of pathetic. Like, it's so hard to convey the power that dreams can have on your psyche um, in words, right? Or for me, it is. Um, I don't keep a dream journal. I have at various points, but I have a number of recurring dreams. Like this, I have a very persistent recurring dream about um, like alligators or crocodiles where I'm sort of pressured or forced into like swimming with them in a in that sort of dream logic way it's like I can't I, somehow I'm like this is I don't want to do this but I, I I just have to I just have to somehow and having this kind of combined feeling like this very ambivalent feeling about them I think is the essence of the dream which I've tried to convey in my work uh this like intense attraction to something but also revulsion from it which is a really important thing in my work when it comes to like crocodiles, like Catholic art, bullfighting, like violence. It's all this like, I try for in my work, I tried whenever I feel like a strong ambivalence about a subject, uh, I try to kind of lean into that artistically. Um, so I guess I feel really ambivalent about dreams. Like, I think they're really important, but hard, it's hard to communicate them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Charlie. So appreciate it. Um, so next we have Lachelle Workman, um, a, a 2018 to 2020 um, Queens Museum um, artist in residence in the studio program. Uh, Lachelle earned an MFA from SUNY Purchase College and a BFA in photography from the University of Connecticut. Um, she has participated in residencies at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, the Lighthouse Works, the Shandaket Project at Storm King Art Center, Oxbow School, the Vermont Studio Center and the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts. Um, her work has been exhibited at the 10th Berlin Biennale with Dineo Sashi Bopape, the KAW Institute for Contemporary Art Sculpture Center, um, the Knockdown Center in Massbeth, Queens, um, We Buy Gold, and the Union for Contemporary Art in Omaha, Nebraska. So without further ado, Lachelle, thank you. Lachelle, you just got to unmute. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. So I'm going to just go through a few images of my work and just kind of um, talk about my practice. Um, overall, and then I'll just end that tying into some recent projects. Um, so my practice examines memorials, uh, specifically um, within my work, I look at the cultural iconography of memorial t-shirts or RIP t-shirts. Um, and I think about um, the, the structure of the t-shirt in relation to public space, particularly inner city landscapes, um, inner city communities, um, and just thinking about the relationship between the body, the land, and overall um, this, this kind of history of the way that memorials and monuments have been um, structured here in the United States. Um, so within this process, I often employ analog slide projectors, overhead projectors. Um, I really think about the formula of the memorial t-shirt, thinking about image, text, and then the object of, of the t-shirt. Um, and in many ways, um, I'm often breaking that down in terms of 
separating the image from the shirt, um, employing the slide projector as kind of like this active um, presence within the gallery space, in which with some of these pieces, such as this one, um, Justice for Blank, where the same slide is repeated over and over and over again. Um, and within that, I'm thinking about language, I'm thinking about kind of like these, um, the way the Memorial T-shirt has um, also become present within movements such as Black Lives Matter, um, and just, you know, this idea of it being this rallying cry for, for people who've lost their lives due to acts of violence, due to untimely deaths. Um, and, and within that, I, I often think about this relationship to the street side memorial um, in, in just kind of like this interesting way that there's this reverence to even these self-made memorials that we find um, either on the side of the highway, either, you know, on the sidewalk where someone lost their life. Um, and within this, I'm, I'm trying to think about how that relates to the history of monuments and memorials. Who, what kind of people have we chosen to memorialize throughout history? Um, where are those monuments usually placed? Especially thinking of things like federal and state um, funded monuments and memorials. And within that, you know, my work always brings me back to this question of what does it mean to, what does it mean for the, for these t-shirts to be wearable memorials? Um, it's, you know, a way that they are often described. Um, and I think about this link between wearing that t-shirt to memorialize a person who's lost their life while still using your own living body. Um, and, you know, often like with doing research about this subject, thinking about the way that it's, you know, now merged into popular culture where we often see memorial t-shirts for celebrities, public figures, um, but, but there's also, you know, this specific history of these t-shirts coming out of black and brown communities where, you know, in, in many instances, they even replace um, traditional funeral attire. And thinking about this kind of historical link between like the um, the southern um, black funeral procession that's you know rooted in like the Baptist and Pentecostal church and thinking about you know where do these customs come from um, thinking about the time that they exist um, after you know th this migration um, from the south and I'm thinking of also about the ways that they relate to a lack of memorials in inner city spaces. Um, and within some of these works, um, within the majority of my work, I'm employing t-shirts um, and abstraction. So I'm often deconstructing these shirts and asphalt came about in my work sometime around 2015 when I was graduating from SUNY Purchase and entering the uh, Skohegan um, School of Painting. Um, it was a residency that you know, really transformed my practice. And what I was experimenting with was ways of stiffening the shirts, um, letting them hold gesture, but trying to think about the way that abstraction could be a method for freeing up the body of having to be the sole source of wearing this shirt. Like what are the other spaces that these shirts can show up? How can they engage with monumentality in a way that that speaks to um, these kind of histories of self-made rituals, um, self-made memorials. Um, and then I think about that link um, to inner city space and the way that inner city spaces are often, you know, the places that lack the funding to create infrastructure. Um, so, you know, using infrastructural materials has oddly been something that has been a part of my practice for many years. And it's, you know, um, given me this kind of freedom to experiment with the way, the, with the materiality of the shirt. Um, many times I'm employing the same way that these shirts are made. For example, the image on the right, where there's this image transfer process where, you know, a person picks an image. Um, they choose the text and the t-shirt shop makes these shirts um, and then thinking what what could it what could the possibilities be um, for engaging more abstraction thinking about um, 
what can happen outside of the direct space of mourning. Um, how can how can the labor of mourning be shared um, and you know envisioned in a way that offers more agency to people who live in these spaces, or that offers really more agency to to all of us who find um, these broad narratives that are that have been missing from the, the history of memorial specifically here um, in in the U.S. And within this process, I often employ photography, um, performance, um, mostly sculpture and installation. But within, in, in, within this process, especially with making these photographs, going back to my hometown of Bridgeport, Connecticut, or rather the town that I was born in, um, and, and using that as this way of continuing to engage with the landscape, continuing to think about how memorials are present within these spaces and how they can um, essentially take up more space and invite people to um, kind of like reclaim these spaces that are right in proximity to where we all live, but that somehow are, you know, no, no longer have an active human narrative. Um, and, and it's been, you know, a great experience to not only explore this at the Queens Museum because of just, you know, the, the broad community programs that um, have been established here and that continue to be available. Um, you know, this, these last two years have greatly informed my practice, um, being able to bring in this broader community engagement, um, particularly um, with, you know, looking at performance, looking at larger installations. Um, yeah, and I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Lachelle. Um, and I think so my colleague, uh, Lynn Malashevsky, who is the Queens Museum's Archives and Collections Manager, has a question for Lachelle. Hi, Lachelle. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Um, so in looking through your work, I was super interested in your connection to text and language, which um, you activate in performance and you brought in, even into the earlier t-shirt works to support uh, the projectors. You had books underneath there, which was great to me. Um, and you've also produced a book that you mentioned drew from family photographs and the idea of a scrapbook. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how language infuses your work um, and also how even an abstract language comes in, thinking about the glitch and the cut up collage um, and even your use of industrial materials. Sure, sure, thank, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so within like my thoughts of language. Um, initially, this is something that really just became a part of the, the formula of making the shirts. Um, There's even my own experience of making these shirts for a loved one that I lost and thinking about how jarring that was. It was very interesting to me how the, the text that we were all submitting, like choosing the photo that you're going to use of you and your loved one, choosing the, 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 the text or the phrase that could somehow you know, speak to that law, speak to what that person means. It's very interesting to me to, to kind of like break down these formulas and to, to display them with this, um, this method of using the slide projectors. And initially that was interesting to me because of the slide projectors ability to continue to display um, a, a message, to continue to display um, language in a way that I thought that elevated vernacular, um, even thinking about simple sayings like, you know, within one piece, um, we, yes, we are still alive. Um, thinking about Christina Sharp's work and the idea of the wake and how, you know, you know, African Americans see themselves in this kind of afterlife of slavery that's always present in some, some ways. And in many ways, thinking about language has offered me a way to, to really expand the idea of what gets memorialized because it's not just people. I'm often thinking of things like spaces, thinking about um, spaces that are no longer active or present, thinking about you know things like businesses that have left. And I also think about the same, the things that people say to each other coming and passing um, throughout these neighborhoods, um, thinking about salutations and how they are very much linked to 
the memorial t-shirt. Um, and, 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 you know, this has been a productive way to explore that because there's something about projecting language onto object that I think um, just calls into question um, these traditions in a, in a way that um, I've, I've been curious about just looking at um, the way that the memorial t-shirts show up. Like I really want to know what can happen if people are offered more agency to think about where does this tradition come from? Um, is it somehow linked to a certain absence of engaging with the audience? Thank you, Lachelle. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I so appreciate it. Um, so all of these conversations could be an hour in and of themselves. Um, and I, I, I really appreciate everyone um, presenting today. So next, um, we have uh, Jay Marie Kim, um, who's an advanced certificate candidate in the Social Practice Queens program um, at Queens College. Uh, Jay Marie is currently working on a project situated in Flushing, Queens, um, that examines the historical protest document, um, the Flushing Remonstrance, um, and is a starting point to think about language, translation, and Flushing's singular history of religious freedom and connecting its current state. Um, she received the Queen's Art Fund and New Work Grant in 2020 in support of this project. Um, so take it away, Jay Marie. Thank you. Hi. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Hear you well. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, yeah. First, I want to thank uh, Lindsay and also the Queen's Museum and SBQ Queen's College uh, for this opportunity to present and share my work. Um, I wanted to take this um, time to kind of show a work in progress, it's something that I've been working on um, since uh, 2019. And it's uh, taking a look at the history of Flushing and specifically uh, the document, um, the Flushing Remonstrance. It was written in 1657, so it's over 360 years old. And um, it's a document, it's a, it's a protest um, and it's in support for religious freedom. And it's one of the first um, recorded documents that, uh, uh, that supports uh, religious freedom for all. And um, it's kind of viewed as a precursor to um, the constitution as well. So it's, it's very significant, but it's also um, uh, not known and uh, particularly around Flushing, where it has the most diverse uh, religious sites, even to this day. So I feel like um, this disconnect between its history and its current state, that's something that I'm kind of interested in bridging. And I feel that that idea of bridging and bringing together um, makes me think about translation and thinking of translating this document into the various languages that are spoken and used in Flushing. So, um, you know, I started with English and just trying to read through the document in itself in English was, there's, you know, the language is also different. It, it's from a different time. So it, that in itself was like the entry point for me to kind of break down, what does this mean uh, for me now, you know, as somebody who immigrated, uh, you know, with my parents, and it almost seems like my own, own kind of American identity kind of started when you land in America, rather than this kind of historical point. So I feel like this document sets a precedence for me as to kind of give me uh, the roots uh, that's just beyond the time of my own kind of immigration time and uh, connected to uh, you know, this idea of, I have rights of this place as well, a sense of belonging and a sense of home. Um, so I started to uh, work with translators and uh, documenting and also translating uh, the Flushing Remonstrance. Um, so I have uh, Mandarin Chinese, I have Korean. Um, I'm also working on um, uh, Spanish and other languages as well. Um, and then I'm starting to reach out to other artists. Uh, this is Gina Minnelli, 
uh, who photograph different religious sites. And, um, and by the way, I'm not the only one who's interested in the Flushing Remonstrance or Flushing and its religious sites. Uh, Queens Museum also did a show called um, In Conscious uh, in, um, about the Flushing Remonstrance and its uh, 350th anniversary in 2007 with various artists. And um, that was also very socially engaged. And, um, and also um, artists uh, who um, showed, uh, who was part of uh, the 2019 show called um, Monuments to an Effigy, Alexandra Smith. Um, she worked with um, the Macedonia Church. And um, very interesting, uh, the ch church is since then demolished. So I feel like there's, you know, you know, what happens to these religious sites and its history when it's completely uh, demolished and the community is now gentrified with a lot of these uh, commercial um, uh, real estate and, you know, these buildings that are being uh, popping up everywhere. So um, that's something for me to kind of think about um, and to explore. And, um, and then and the other point, point um, that I'm interested in, other than language and translation, is um, how information is being um, uh, transported or understood within the community. And this is uh, a woman just kind of standing by uh, the kiosk of the signage uh, for uh, religious, uh, the Freedom Mile. And, um, you know, she's just standing there kind of, you know, has the newspaper and, you know, it's a very kind of analog way of um, transmitting information. And these uh, posts in these uh, kind of like uh, dead spaces of maybe the shopping mall and you know the wall is just being used as post-its for classifieds um and just kind of expanding on how i can use uh the digital form as a point of engagement because after uh the quarantine i was thinking about how um you know what how can i uh, engage with the community if I'm not doing that in the physical form. So um, start to kind of think about, uh, you know, doing a survey um, and translating that into different languages. Um, so that's where I'm at now. And this, I just want to include, um, you know, just within a couple of months, just all the events and um, the activities that's been happening in Flushing in terms of Black Lives Matter. Um, there's the pro-Trump supporters and also the massive uh, lines for uh, the food pantry. So this is where I am right now with this project. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Marie. Um, I'm actually going to be the one asking you a question today. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate this work. Um, it's definitely something that all of us at Queens Museum have thought a lot about, given that Flushing is, is right in our backyard. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but my question is really about, um, yeah, how you see the Flushing Remonstrance kind of living on um, in current organizing, community organizing in Flushing. Um, and yeah, how is this idea of belonging that is in the Remonstrance um, continuing to resonate in a city that is constantly changing? Um, but also I'm curious about this idea of translation and how you see it as a creative act. Yeah, those are really great questions and really great for uh, thinking more about the project. Um, well, I think that somehow um, this idea of uh, the Flushing Remonstrance, the fact that it's a, a concrete document that has been in existence for since 1657, can live kind of in the DNA of the neighborhood. And somehow that can resonate and that can set a precedence for community work 
or uh, even having these historical sites just being there. And even though it's not um, maybe uh, completely accessible to the community as a whole, but the fact that these histories still exist, I think they maybe subconsciously um, may have an effect on the way religious diversity still exists in Flushing. Thank you, Jay Marie. Yeah, and do you want to touch on this idea of translation as a creative act? I'm really interested in that as, as being part of your practice. Yeah, I think um, that's, you know, I feel like translation is, is something that I've always done because I'm a second language learner. So there's that point where, you know, you're translating, but I think that also with, uh, you know, something as opaque or esoteric as like a historical document, when you translate it, I think it brings it to, you know, it, you know, it has the ability to transcend time and also to give identity to people at its, you know, very visceral and very kind of, you know, accessible state, so. Wonderful, thank you, Jay Marie. Um, so last but not least, um, we have um, Adam Nadell coming up, who is a recent MFA candidate in the um, Social Practice Queens program at Queens College. Um, Nadell works at the intersection of science, art, and human rights. His photographic-based practice is grounded in a narrative of human choice and agency. Um, his exhibitions on disease, war, and the Anthropocene have been presented domestically and internationally, um, including the Hotel de Ville in Paris, National Museum of Ghana, the Field Museum, Everglades National Park, and the UN headquarters. He's a recipient of two NIFA fellowships in photography, um, two prizes in World Press Photo, and has received grants from the National Science Foundation, Magnum Foundation and Queen's Council on the Arts. So without that further ado, go ahead, Adam. Thanks, Lindsay. Can you, uh, can you guys see the screen and hear me? Give me. We can up. hear you, but your screen isn't on. You can turn your screen on. Are you talking about uh, me in particular or the, the photograph? We see the photograph, um, but we don't see you. It's, I'm going to turn it on once the question starts, because I, I like doing this standing up, which means you'll be looking at my belly button moving. Oh, back no problem. Forth. Go right ahead. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> which would be a very different kind of uh, uh, performance. Um, no problem. What I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna flip through my, my last, sort of my last year creatively. Um, and I'm gonna show you sort of two different bodies. The first one is, is, uh, is from uh, BJ's Wholesale Club in, uh, in College Point. A couple of weeks after lockdown, I, I started going out there to shoot uh, people waiting to buy food, people loading up their cars and, and people leading, leaving. Um, it's a work in progress. And what I'm showing you here are the photographs. I also have uh, objects that, uh, that everyone bought. Um, and those will be combined uh, down the road, but I, uh, I would love to have any thoughts or, or, or ideas about um, different ways to do that. Uh, but let me run through these things. Basically, uh, the underlying premise for me is, is uh, what is real. And it's, it's the idea of time and place uh, as represented in, in, in photographs uh, in uh, interacting with uh, the physicality of, of literal objects. So for example, like the objects in like these carts, I have, I have those, uh, the, the, the containers and the shells, what, what was left after the food was eaten. Okay, the second group I'm gonna show you, uh, this happened in Jackson Heights. Uh, there was a bit of a scare and they thought there was gonna be a riot. Uh, it again involves the idea of uh, photograph, photography, memory, because uh, I've collected a lot of this plywood that people use to cover up their 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 buildings uh, and uh, and they're essentially trying to protect their livelihoods or, or their physical selves. And these, when the photos are displayed, they'll be it will be in partnership with the physical objects.
essentially trying to play with the idea of memory uh, reality as as memory uh, versus a, a sensory uh, and, and the physicality of, a, of an object. Um, here's some stuff I've finished. Uh, this project I just talked to you about involves sort of a larger concept, which I've been playing with for about two years, which is, uh, you know, really small in nature. What is photography? Uh, so it's, I'm going to flip through this stuff really quick. I started at 50, I got through, oh, great. I got a couple, a little bit of time. Um, so it's essentially trying to figure out, is there an essence to photography or not? Um, so obviously what I just referenced is, is, is uh, the, the idea of, Time and space and physicality and is is an essential ingredient of that uh, that question and and so is the nature of of the physical medium. So this is oh, I just made a mistake. And this is the last bit. These are these are gloves that I picked up, I photographed, and then I actually physically have these gloves. So I'm sorry. This is this is part of the first uh, the, the first two above. So it's to figure out a how to in display, how to create a physical relationship between the two. And because I'm engaged in social practice, it's, it's also how to sort of bridge that into, into an incorporation of a larger community involved, which is really all of us, because this is a, one of those rare events that is entirely universal in nature. Um, so back to my speech on photography. So this is, this is photography, so this is photography without light. Uh, this is done through uh, particle beam, 40 by 40s. Um, so it's bombarding the paper with uh, without photons and getting a photographic image, um, which essentially uh, is counterpoint to to most discourse concerning what photography is uh, as a physical object of making. Uh, this is uh, some stuff I've been playing around with, um, with tin types and then puncturing them and painting them, uh, playing around with the ideas of color versus form. Uh, it has its origin in sort of a conversation uh, about painting and its relationship to photography. Uh, but obviously it's the ideas of past history and the present. And uh, there's a much larger narrative involved. It's, this is all about the Civil War. Uh, but I, I don't want to we don't have time. I don't. We don't have time to get into that. I think, uh, or at least, I, if we get into it, I won't. I won't do it justice. Um, these are objects about uh, creating a, like a, a, a new uh, visual lexicon. So essentially, creating a new uh, visual language that can be uh, sensed by machines or actually felt like Braille. So this is a portrait of myself, and uh, these are uh, these are different uh, different emotions. Uh, on on a human face, and I'll just end up because I with um, these just works totally works in progress, which is inspired by ideas of photography. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to talk about them too much because I don't quite understand what they are yet. Which is what I really enjoy about my practice is um, I'll dig into these over the next couple of months and and play with them uh, physically and creating more and and eventually uh, hopefully uh, come up with a. Uh, some interesting ways of of me understanding them and where they came from, both emotionally and me, and and you know, grind being able to ground it to a uh, to a philosophical uh, narrative associated with aesthetics and photography. All right, let me give you guys screen, screen back here. Uh, Thank you, Adam. Um, so my question for you is. Um, if you could speak to the ways that you relate the visual languages and practices of your, you know, your, you've worked for so long as a photojournalist, um, as well, and in relation to the kind of more experimental work you've been doing race recently in terms of the sensorial processes of photography, such as tin types, but also the sculptural objects you're making. I wonder if you could speak to that, um, that relationship or even transition. Yeah, it, uh, well, one really nice thing is I've been able to maintain, maintain both simultaneously because uh, I'm still a working um, editorial photographer. Uh, and, and obviously from the, the, the work from the, from the first months of the pandemic, you know, it's pretty much straight docu documentation, docu documentarian. Um, what the opportunity I really love is, is 
Um, I'm sorry, I tried to, uh, I'm trying to get the screen so I can actually turn myself on. And for some reason, it's not happening. So I'm not going to keep on trying it because I'll get distracted. No um, so so what's what's really wonderful is that, you know, for when I started working, uh, I just, you know, I had some really simple goals. I wanted to work for the Associated Press, travel the world, and be a war photographer. And, and that was the depth of my, um, uh, my that was the scope of my ambition. And, and I, I thought a lot, but in the process of doing that, I began to very quickly, because I left the uh, Associated Press in two years, began thinking a lot about the, the medium itself, how it's used uh, in, in and by society and, and, and by, the, uh, by the, 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 the more powerful and influential structures within society. Uh, and also about just basically the medium itself. Uh, like, like what is a representation? What is a photograph? Um, and it can, it, it, when I started off, I could have a very easy answer when I was in school, but the more I actually worked in the medium, the more I realized it was, it became much more uh, complica complicated and complex. And what's been absolutely fantastic about going back to school uh, is it's given me an opportunity to take those sort of um, feelings and intuitions and sort of fragments of ideas and to be able to um, try to put them together in both physical objects and in, and in text. Um, so in, in, in a way, I'm, I'm just sort of filling in on, on all my lack of, <laughs> lack of sophisticated analysis and thinking for the last 20 years. I finally, I finally get to uh, catch up on that and find out what I, what I perhaps have really been doing the whole time. Great, thank you so much, Adam. So I'm, I think I can stop your screen sharing. Yeah. Perfect, there you thanks. Oh, great. Here. All right. Oh, this is me, yeah, just to show you. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Um, so I'm really happy, grateful. Thank you. Thank you to all of our incredible artists who presented this afternoon for spending your Sunday with us. Um, I also just wanted to open it up to questions from, um, from our audience um, who are here. Um, please feel free to type your question into the Q&A function. Um, but I actually wanted to start with a question, Shin, thank you for answering, um, that came on early in, in Shin's presentation, and maybe you could speak more to it, and if others want to speak to it as well, from Lowell, um, who asked if, if folks can discuss um, the process of attaining ideas, and then the further process of actually carrying out that idea or executing that idea. Um, so Shin, I don't know if you want to speak to kind of the answer you gave first, and then if other folks want to jump in to their process? Yeah, so um, the I, I wrote down there already, but a lot of time. Sorry, lunch time. No <laughs> problem. Um, um, so I always kind of like imagine my process a little bit like story making. I think probably come from like growing up reading manga and like just the fantasy part of my work um, is kind of like telling a story. And I kind of like, maybe Jennifer, you, this is where we can connect and talk, share a little bit. Like I always feel like those making process is a little bit like having a dream, but not in like um, the romantic way, but in the, in the actual sensorial way that when like, I don't know if folks have like dreams that like, you know, you're kind of part of it, but you're also directing it. It's like this half-half mixed relationship with those story and playing out in your own head uh, while you're like in control, but also not. I feel like a lot like that as I'm making projects. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my answer uh, to, to the question, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the thing that, idea formation has in common with dreams is the sort of ephemeral nature of um, artistic ideas. Like I find I always have to write things down right away. When I have, I'm also kind of verbal like Shin, so I get a lot of my ideas from reading and I usually write them down in words. Um, and it's like dreams because I, if you don't write it down right away, I'll kind of forget. And then often you'll have the experience of like, looking back on ideas later and having trouble like connecting the, like I find having ideas is sort of a powerful emotional experience that can kind of uh, fade. Um, 
but I find the best, I only have ideas when I'm like working really. I mean, I think the process of working is really generative in terms of making ideas uh, when you're working. I mean, the time you have ideas is when you're working on something else. Uh, often when you're working on one project, it kind of opens up your mind in some way to another project or, or and that's how it is for me. I find that the, 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 the physical process of making objects of, of not maybe uh, intellectual, using an in, intellectual uh, um, uh, intensity while doing it, but as more as an experiential playing tool, um, allows for, for, for to utilize sort of unexpected, like you guys are referencing dreams as sort of subconscious, but I think the same thing can happen tactically with your hands. So I see the process of object making when I make objects as really a process of, of unexpectedly generating connections, which I then at a later date or sometimes during um, realize are, are actually thoughts that are, can, are rationally connected and explainable to someone else. So for me, that's why I, I love the creative process the way I'm doing it now, as opposed to what I was just doing before, is that I'm, I feel like my objects are actually making or bringing out ideas in myself that I can then express in text, but also uh, physically. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Adam. And I often find for myself that, it, you know, there becomes this thing about creating space between the majority of the ideas that come when I'm actually not working, when I'm out in the world, when I'm commuting to, Connecticut or wherever to teach um, when I'm talking to students and through giving them ideas or something completely random that comes about. But also that for me, there's this importance in just um, following these spaces of experimentation, which for me often is um, mostly surrounded with this interest in materiality and giving myself space to really follow those thoughts, follow those um, you know, the space of intuition to want to either learn more about the material Oh no, I think you froze Lachelle. Time. And oh, Lachelle, sorry. you're back. Sorry about that. You're back now. Do you want to just go back a few words? Oh, sure, sure. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, but I was just mentioning, you know, kind of like this importance of materiality in the work, which is really, you know, just similar to those processes that you are following because there is an interest. It may be a means to actually understanding the material, to completing a certain technical problem, but those two things kind of give space to you know, kind of as Adam mentioned, to think about, you know, how these things are connected long before, you know, there is this um, sort of question of how do you explain this to the audience. I think all both of those spaces really facilitate the importance of those other connections to the work and to other subject matter, um, and just being able to give space for those two um, ways of working. Absolutely. Thank you, Lachelle. Um, I also want to leave. So I also want to leave space for if you guys have folks questions for each other. Um, I don't know if anyone does right off the back. I also have some questions if nothing comes up, but I wanted to leave that open. Um, since many of you have known each other for quite a few for two years now over two years. If you have any questions for one another um, during this time. Maybe I'll ask one first, unless one comes up already. Um, and my question is just, you know, just thinking back, I know we have some recent social practice Queens folks here, which is amazing. Um, and this applies to both, you know, the artists who have been with us for two years and some more recently, but just ways in which your practice has shifted in Queens or at Queens Museum. Um, but also like, I'm interested in the ways in which like having a studio in a museum has been unique or strange to you, thinking about public and private in that way. Um, yeah. I can talk, I feel like everyone's shy. Okay. <laughs> I'm always the first one. Uh, um, 
I feel there's something really fascinating in any residency programs and probably in the Queen's Museum, particularly because the space that is actually in the museum is this like kind of studio visit, artists in presence, um, getting to the studio kind of like, I don't know, is a trend or just a, like a thing that probably all of us have experienced through different programs is that the idea of like to know what happens while you're making those work, like even this question we just answered, I feel like it's like really exciting in some way um, that I can talk about my work without like I really figure it out yet. And it's, it's like inspiring and it's like sometimes people like tell you things uh, that you never thought as, as you're actually actively making them. But I also feel like there is this weird um, pressure for artists to talk about their work um, as you're making it in a way because it's verbal. So it's always like, I'll say like logical in some way because it's a certain like expression in visual arts is so much things. It's just like, if I can't write about it, why do I have to make it? You know, it's like this dilemma. I feel like it's very present, especially in studio visits. Um, Sometimes I get questions like very like specific and I really didn't like make a conscious decision when I made it. And I feel like I have to come up with a reason on spot. Um, and I found that quite interesting um, and has been like challenging uh, in some of my practice because I do, I do a lot of uh, residencies and it's like pretty consistent. Um, um, for the past two years yeah yeah i agree with i mean i have, i've like said that same thing before that i mean the point of making making visual art is to kind of convey these experiences that that aren't really explicable in in words or rationally there's some sort of like logical leaps that's happening visually and especially for people that make autobiographical work or make work that's, you know, pretty personal. I mean, this is always a conflict, right, of um, privacy, like of your own privacy, the privacy of people who you're making work about. Um, and, you know, being in the museum was interesting because I really, it was interesting for me to kind of see, um, all the roles, you know, all the roles, uh, all the people that work at a museum <laughs> and kind of what they do. Um, because I think sometimes the art world is so, um, it's very opaque, like what actually people do and what goes on and how many people are contributing to like create one exhibit. Um, so for me, that was actually really, um, really interesting and, and productive. Great. Oh, go ahead, Lachelle. I was just also going to mention, and you know, there's, there's, there was also, you know, something really beneficial about just the variety of programs at the Queen's Museum, and because I think the geographical location, because the Queen's Museum is not at all surrounded by, you know, a plethora of other buildings, it, it, it. it kind of offered this kind of um, incubated space where whether it was running to running into other staff members throughout the hallway, always meeting new people and always, you know, learning about new projects that were taking place. And I think there's, um, you know, something about that that continue, that always, like for me, continued to ask the question of where I see the life of these projects going, even just things that were happening in the studio that were more so process driven. There's something about just, you know, always, you know, having these um, spontaneous conversations with other staff members about the projects, being able to see the full life of the exhibitions um, unfolding that, you know, I, th I think always brought about this question of thinking about like different ways that I think about showing my work. Thank you, Lachelle. Um, and we actually have another question from Lowell. Thank you, Lowell, for these questions. They're great. Um, and Lowell says, thank you to everyone for your responses to the first question. Um, they're asking, can anyone talk about the documentation that occurs during or before creating a finished work? Um, 
talking about inspiration, sketches, or anything in between, or is something realized as a finished project for some? So I think like they're talking about, yeah, how documentation feeds into um, creating a finished work in your processes. Um, well, for me to talk about like inspiration sketches, I mean, I documentation for me is pretty straightforward um, when I finish to work and photographing it. But for sketches, I really don't sketch that much. I mostly I do like um, I do uh, sketches in words for especially for the more complex pieces. I'll do kind of geographical layouts and then I, I will like write do do writing to convey what's going to be in the different places of the of the painting or of the drawing. So for me, my sketching process actually involves mostly um, reading and writing more than more than like literally sketching. Uh, one thing which is interesting about the, the photographic medium uh, when you issue digital or film is you you're actually uh, every time you release the shutter, you're you're essentially making a sketch. You're you're documenting your process. Uh, so um, that's one way in which uh, in, in which that it's sort of documented or recorded, um, but often not really uh, examined afterwards. And the other thing is, then you have corresponding writing that that you're doing, um, which is you know most of it's kind of gibberish. You know, it seemed made sense at the time or, or something like that. Um, but there's a paper trail uh, always associated with that too. But once again, that's that's kind of rarely not seen. It's sort of like the same thing like with a mathematician with a proof. <laughs> I have a from when I worked at Fairby Lab, I have like four hundred pages of this one guy. He's like his always always scribbling before he figured out what he was actually up to. Um, but you you know you never you rarely see that. You just we're a we're a product society. We want the we want the we want the end the commodity that's at the end that uh, that's market. Um, well, for, for me, yes, photographing is a heavy, you know, aspect of documenting, um, particularly with the installation work, um, is, you know, even with making these in the studio, the installation changes so much throughout the course of the day, throughout the course of the week or month. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, especially during this past year and um, thought so much about you know what is that archive of all these photos that we take off and think about the things that i you know save from the internet as being a part of documentation um and how that either relates or is different from you know archiving you know where for me the photo archive is such an extensive part of the work um but there's something about actually photographing the things that I'm physically making in the studio that seem to be, um, that hold more significance um, because I just, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around like what, what is the archiving that we do on a regular basis and, you know, what is digital hoarding also, you know, and where do those ideas go, especially, you know, the ones that we just kind of save and that, you know, we may not run into for another few months or a year. And then, but then in that way, they're still interesting because then you go back and ask that question of like, why you saved it? Why was this important? How does it connect now? And how that relationship changes. I just want to point out that in social practice that the idea of documentation is really kind of integral because a lot of the work that you might do at the point of engagement, you know, how do we document that? You know, how do we document workshops or events that become part of the work? So I think photographing and keeping track of, you know, making an archive and all of those um, documentation is really important. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. If there aren't are there any last questions? I think we're good. We're ending, uh, just coming to a close today, but I just wanna say huge, huge thank you um, to all of the artists who participated, Shin, Jennifer, Lachelle, Jay Marie, Adam, um, thank you. And as well as to QM staff members who joined us um, 
today. Um, we have a second session um, with studio program artists tomorrow, um, Monday evening, beginning at 7 p.m. Um, the artists participating in that are Woman Kim, Iman Ra'ad, The Room of Spirit in Time, and Brianna Harlan from SVQ. Um, so I do encourage you to register for that event as well and join us. And we hope you'll continue to follow the Queen's Museum's residency programs. We're in the process of finalizing um, residents for our Year of Uncertainty Artists in Residence open call. And we hope you'll keep tabs on our uh, social media where we announce opportunities. Um, so yeah, with that, I just want to say have a great Sunday, everyone. Huge thank you again to our artists. Bye, thank guys. You. Bye, thank you.